you can now get rid of the last exchange server. Yes, you can. Long awaited. You know, sometimes we like to joke about how long it takes the exchange team or Microsoft in general to do certain things. Yeah. It's not because they don't, it's not always because they don't understand the customer demand for it. Uh, this is just a classic example. They have had customer demand for a long time to provide a way to remove that last on premises server. Yeah. And for whatever reason, engineering challenges, resourcing challenges, they just didn't want to, you know, we may never know. Uh, for whatever reason, it has taken them until now to deliver it, but now we can. Yes. And to, to clarify then, this is not uninstalling it. So don't stop the podcast now and then go and hit the uninstall button. That will cause you loads of pain. Um, well, apart from the folks who say, I've, I've just been using ANSI Edit all this time. <laughs> um, and to, to, to those people, good on you. Um, but don't, don't hit and install, it will do some damage. Uh, what Microsoft have not done is continued to overthink this and come up with the perfect solution, which is fine, right? You know, we got to that point where it, there's no one wants us to, no, no one wants to, to get the, the perfect thing here and wait another year. So it does mean that to strip out that last exchange server, you can switch it off and leave it off. Maybe you boot it up every now and then. Um, or there's a set of scripts which rips it out unceremoniously without taking all of the other configuration with it. Um, right. But it is, it's the, it's the management tools, right? You know, uh, the, the PowerShell commandlets is what, what, what you get for recipient management for cloud objects and all the bits and this is the reason why you don't do it. That's just all the other things associated with it, email address policies, remote domains uh, and, and so on. Management of all of those. Um, still done in their local AD. This isn't a source of authority change as right. sort of talked about or a write back feature that again they've positioned as an idea that they might have done. They've went pretty straightforward and said, well, what about a cut down set of the admin snap-ins? So crazy admins out there. Uh, folks who just like to bypass RBAC may well have on Exchange 2010 and above added the peer snap-in with the exchange management tools themselves. Maybe you locked yourself out of RBAC or there was a problem with a web service or you've done something and you had to fix it. You may have already went in that way. It's, it's similar to that if you've been there. If you haven't, then... You add the PS snap in set of DLLs that are loaded, loads that that module of commandlets, and uh, off you go uh, to to start carrying on editing your recipients. You know this. It's funny you said that Microsoft was trying to ship to prioritize shipping something over having a perfect solution that covered every use case because yeah, this is very much what they used to do in days of old. Right, yes. They would ship something that was a, a partial or I don't want to say incomplete because that sounds bad. They would ship something that was not necessarily a complete solution for every case, and then they would improve it uh, because they prioritized speed or velocity in shipping into a competitive marketplace. If you look at what they did with you know, yeah. <coughs> starting around Exchange 5, when they were actively competing against other email vendors, they, they really had to be able to do that. Yeah, And I think in some ways – Although the velocity of the M365 platform as a whole is very good, uh, and in you know in some cases, like if you look at the velocity of del feature delivery for Teams, yeah. it's spectacularly good. Um, this feature, for whatever reason, was dragging a little bit, and I'm really glad to see them get something out the door rather than waiting for a perfect solution. This is good enough yeah. for what most people need. Yes, and. I, I chatted to um, Greg Taylor two years ago, well, over two years ago, when he was the person in Microsoft who was responsible for Exchange. And later that year, he said, oh, we might have something in the spring. Sorry, we've got no news to report. We talked about that in the podcast, I think, <laughs> several times over, you know, over the years. And he, he, he did, you know, he, he did a podcast with us. And we were chatting about this, and he said, I don't think um, that everybody's going to want to remove the last exchange server. And I think that's true because there's still that mail relay aspect and people do want to keep it for those things. You speak to a larger customer, there may be a thousand 
employees or more, and that have enough stuff that needs reliable mail flowing outside the organisation, and they won't have an impetus to find another mail server solution to put in place, or it would be a worse thing to put in something that they don't understand or can't manage, that they're going to keep that around. So this is focused on that single exchange server remaining. Perhaps you right. um, have, have moved off to the cloud, but you still need AD. But you only had a single server. You've not got mail relay uh, requirements. Uh, so it's a little bit of a niche, and it's a niche to me within a niche of people who also are quite happy in that little segment to use PowerShell to manage it. Yeah, but I think the the ongoing amount of management that you have to do, even if you are not uh, Jeff Gay or Michael Van Hornbeek, you're not a PowerShell expert. Yeah, I think the number of things that you'll need to do on an ongoing basis are small enough that, that anybody can pick this up. Yeah, uh, we're, we're not really talking about having to be the reincarnation. Well, I shouldn't say the reincarnation of Don Jones because thank goodness <laughs> he's still with us. But you wouldn't have to be his, you know, his clone. Um, to be able to do the things that you need to do here. I don't think we're talking about a lot of terribly advanced tasks. No, not at, not, not at all. And you're not going to need to follow a blog on Practical 365 from Ingo to be able to to, to, to fathom your way around it. Um, there's common tasks like uh, adding uh, recipient permissions when you're hybrid, but most of those go to the, go, go to the Exchange Admin Center in the cloud. Um, it right. is updating somebody's mail address or enabling a remote mailbox. Uh, so those kind of tasks that you might do after a new user starts, um, as if you've got provisioning scripts today, then that those might be, be things that you'll update slightly because obviously you don't get remote PowerShell. But I think it's, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's not, it's not onerous, is it? Not hardly. And, you know, Getting this capability is worth a small amount of additional learning. If you're not conversant with PowerShell, it won't take you long to pick it up. Well, I'm almost through writing um, a, a right-click PowerShell uh, tool where you right-click it, it launches a local web server that's well, local host only on a random port, and that's and as you click it, it it, it gives you an Exchange Admin Center. Um, so that will be hoping for last week but uh, a few things got in the way um, but but it will be very shortly because it's almost working um, uh, fully. I look forward um, to seeing that. Yes yeah, so for those that do desire some sort of web-based interface you will have that uh, very shortly because Microsoft aren't going to provide one because uh, obviously when I was on the preview that was the first question I asked how you know is, is there a next gen from this um, as as of now this is the thing that you get, all right? Um, mail relay, all that sort of stuff. You're going to have to think of your own solution. Um, and as Jeff has said before um, on this podcast, uh, when he's joined us, you know, edge server licensing, Scott Schnall has also confirmed, you know, that sort of stuff isn't included in the hybrid licensing. But there have been some hybrid licensing changes of, of note. Yep. There have and, been. Um <laughs> The idea that now you can have a, air quotes, free hybrid license for Exchange 2019, uh, yeah. that's pretty significant, I think. Yeah. And there's, there are some reasons for keeping uh, current with your hybrid server, but on an Exchange version, because obviously there's been guidance before this from Microsoft, no need to move to Exchange 26, from Exchange 2016 to 2019. Stay on that for the moment. When when we do something about the last Exchange server, then maybe you'll need an update for Exchange 2016. Obviously, that's transpired that you don't. Uh, and there is one benefit in particular with uh, an Exchange 2019 server, and that is the cut-down footprint and the ability to upgrade the OS on an ongoing basis. So that can now run on Exchange server, sorry, on Windows Server 2022. Uh, if you had already deployed that to 2019, then you could upgrade your Windows Server version in place. And things like that are important to folks, especially when they're managing a smaller set of, of servers anyway. Uh, that That's a useful thing. It's, a, it, it's, it's traditionally been a bit niche. I've not had many customers who, faced with the prospect of paying for an Exchange Server license, will upgrade solely to get a couple of benefits. But if that's, there, if that's you, then... 
well, you might have the Windows Server license cost to, to counter, but the, the Exchange Hybrid Server license um, is, is free for 2019, which is good, uh, because there's no more CUs for Exchange Server 2016. It's, it's so transpires either. That's it. Yep. And, you know, it's hard to complain about that. It is 2022. Yep. Microsoft is, uh, they, they have certainly supported that product well. They're still going to continue to release security updates for the product. You mean there's going to be more security bugs in it? I mean, no, I'm sure we found them all, Steve. But... <laughs> I hope not, because now you get paid if you find a bug. Yes, yes. So it was really interesting. Uh, there, there is a very, very, very good newsletter by a gentleman named Zach Whitaker called This Week in Security that I, I very strongly recommend. Yeah. Uh, and he, this week, released, uh, a, in, in this past week's edition, he talked about the findings of Google's Project Zero and uh, Mandiant Labs, both of which do a lot of work researching zero days. Yeah. And they estimate that there were somewhere between about 60 and about 200 zero days exploited last year. Now, one of the things that's fascinating to me is just the difference between those two numbers. Yeah. Right. They, they use different sources of threat intelligence. Google, of course, a big part of project zero is that they are actively looking for zero days. Yeah. So that they can then sort of defang them. Um, a big part of what drives that market in zero days is having bug bounties where vendors will pay people who discover those kinds of problems yeah. so that they get reported to the vendor instead of sold to people who will productize or weaponize them. So I, I just don't even know what to say, man. It's about time that yes. Exchange is included in this program. I don't know why it took so long. I think I'm it's, glad it's being and, included. And it is the on-premises office products as well. So... Yes, um, I suppose finding a bug on its own isn't going to find a bug in a in SharePoint server. Um, I think that there's some listeners here who may think that there's lots. Um, to be fair, um, but that's a matter of opinion. Uh, Exchange Server, I I think when a lot of these bugs came out and security flaws, there were certain things where, especially there was one about auto discover, and a lot of folks, including ourselves, went, "It's not really a flaw. It's not a bug, actually." Or Oh, well, I wouldn't consider that, you know, that, that's something that most exchange admins have mitigated against for years when, you know, we, when we encounter certain things and to, to a wider cybersecurity industry and then finding that, you know, that obviously there's a lot of people that are running this stuff that just thrown it in and forgot about it, never patched it. It doesn't seem such an issue. Um, so if you are an exchange admin, you know it inside out, maybe you're one of the few Microsoft certified masters out there. Maybe you should have a bit of a digging around and grab yourself maybe $30,000 for finding something serious. You know, the file viewers used by Outlook Web Access or Outlook Web App, those have certainly been a fertile source of security bugs in the past. So if you were looking for something to start, I think I might suggest that as you know, the first focus. But it is good to see Microsoft bringing these on-prem products under the same disclosure and bounty umbrella that they've had for a while so that's a super positive change absolutely and as you say there's you know there's things that are a little deployed that are going to be uh perhaps worth having a look at because actually yes it's great to perhaps go after the on-premises office web app servers um that replace the file viewers as well for example where they're not patched as regularly as you as, as you might expect but obviously they're a much lower target to, to sort of pick off but for those that use them they'll be bigger larger enterprises who you know you could save a lot of of pain uh by by helping find those uh and get the get them fixed uh so absolutely worthwhile but removing the last exchange server i i didn't think that we would get that far so that's really good news uh, and of course check out practical 365 because we've got article from me on this at the moment tony redmond uh, has got a you know, a wider commentary about some of these newer updates that have arrived too. Uh, so what that book bounty is about, a bit more detail in this new update model for Exchange as well that's arriving for 2019. Check out the website for, for all of that stuff and more. <laughs>